What is up, everybody, for Data on Kubernetes Community live stream number 120. Super Whoa! Stoked. Yes, super stoked for the day. Super stoked. This is the first time we're making DOK history in many senses. It's the first time that we have a soundproof studio complete with towels being used to get the cleanest sound quality. It's for the, you, dear it's the first, watchers. It's the first time that we have the hardest working human in show business, or should I say in Joe business, who's rocking on TikTok, <laughs> from TikTok all the way over to LinkedIn to Twitter. I do crazy stuff with rap videos, but Joe, you're, you're absolutely in another league, killing it in terms of content. Absolutely love it. Very healthy for a space. It's often quite not so tangible, uh, not so celebratory. And I really appreciate the energy that you're bringing, the kindness, the genuine help that you're providing to folks. So very nice to have you with us. For the people who don't know you so well, can we find out who is Joe Carlson? Yeah, I'll give a quick intro. Also, I just want to say, I was just like, I really was just throwing wrenches in your flow there on your intro. I, uh... <laughs> no, no, you're like, you're like my hype man. You're like my hype I know, man. I'm trying to hype you up, but I'm just like throwing rocks and sticks in your, your bike spokes. Um, no, that was an amazing intro. Thank you so much. Um, so yeah, my name is Joe Carlson. I'm a developer advocate. I've worked for a bunch of database companies. I'm currently working for a database company called Single Store DB, formerly MemSQL. Um, and yeah, I make like content. I make like videos. I write, I just chat with people. I go to conferences. I just get to like talk and do fun stuff all the time. Uh, and today I'm on uh, the Data on Kubernetes podcast with you, Bart, which is, uh, you know, honestly the highlight of my week. Yeah, my, mine too. And big shout out to, uh, to Dan Pop for putting us together. Seriously, this is what Ooh. a lot of this game is about. When you see two people that are like, they should meet each other, make mm. that happen. Don't just sit on yeah. that. So it's a big yeah. shout out to Pop for that. Yeah. Um, and uh, Joe, you're originally from uh, that accent? From Minnesota. Um, so like I'm uh, in the, the no coast up here. The, the 12 developers not on either of the coasts in the United States. Um, or there are dozens of us and we're here. Okay. That's all I'm and saying. You're, and you're solid. Yeah, exactly. You know what? It's like, I mean, whatever. I feel like in the remote world, we're still obsessed with New York and LA or um, San Francisco, but like, whatever, like remote, like you can work anywhere these days. Anyway, so I'm from Minnesota. It's cold. I lived in Hawaii for a couple of years and now I'm back in Minnesota. Okay. That's good. That's good. That's good. Um, just so everybody knows, you know, Joe will almost certainly, fingers crossed, be speaking in our co-located event in KubeCon on May 16th um, because he submitted some awesome proposals in our CFP. Just going to drop the link here real quick on YouTube so that if you haven't submitted a proposal yet, please do so. Guidelines are very, very clear. If you have questions, as always, feel free to reach out in Slack. That's pretty much all I got, though, in the way, as, you know, in terms of an intro. Um, but Joe, if you want to jump into your presentation, remember, everybody, you can get your questions here in the YouTube chat. We'll get them answered accordingly. If not, we can keep the conversation going afterwards on Slack. Um, but Joe, if you want to start sharing your screen, go for it. Oh, actually, I don't even have a deck yet. I'm like just sort of putting it together. So maybe we'll just kind of like chat about it. Good. Um, let's see here. I, um, I, uh, uh, I'm actually trying to pull up the data in Kubernetes stream here so I can keep up with the chat over here too. I'm sure Bart will interrupt me too if anything, um, anything happens or if I miss anything here either. But um, uh, also, I just want to say just in regards to the sending, sending CFPs too, like if you're new at developing or like new at giving talks, you should for sure submit. It's a great way to like, learn stuff um, and your perspective as a newbie is really important too. Um, of course, experts, I'm sure are welcome, Bart, Ryan, I'm sure everyone's welcome, but uh, I just want to say just everyone should uh, feel free to present. Absolutely correct. I, I think, it, like you said, it's good experience. Uh, the worst thing that can happen is we say no, but it's also, it's a great way for us to get to know you, to talk to you. Maybe we can get you hooked in for a live stream on a different date. Lots of options there. So just, just reach out. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, let's see here. So this is a talk I'm actually like in working on. I'm like almost done with it, but it's not working on the deck yet. But I kind of want to chat with you two about it. And I'd love to get your chat's feedback on this too. Okay. Um, but the whole idea around this too is just giving a gentle introduction to building data intensive applications. And right, and like the data on Kubernetes, like this whole community is about building scalable data applications. And it's shocking to me that like this didn't exist before, you know, Bart, you came along and kind of started putting this together. Cause like data is super important. Data demands are only growing and the rate at which like how we're using that data is only getting more and more intense. And I think that we're seeing like 
it's just that's not going to change right i think like i think our current projections like x we're seeing exponential growth in data storage demands we're going to see doubling amount of global data storage by 2025 which is what like three years from now um that's that's which is wild that's wild that we're going to be doubling that so like the point is getting into and understanding the data space is incredibly important and it's something that we're still going to need like human beings are still going to need to be maintaining that and working on that moving forward you know it's like yeah that's super important um I, I think that's a great point. And also because a lot of what we talk about, well, although some things are at a technical level, always keep in mind at an organizational level, something in the past was quite siloed regarding data. Nowadays, the stakeholders that are overlapping into that world, that group is only growing. So like you said, people just simply can't, you know, underestimate the importance of this. Oh my God. Yeah, absolutely. And like, I, I think, I mean, I would love to talk, like make wild projections about the future of Do it. data Do it. here too. Do it. Do um, but uh, I like... I think, I mean, obviously more companies who aren't just the big fang mama companies are going to be jumping in to um, work in the data space. You know what I mean? Like, um, like brick and mortar stores are going to be doing like uh, customer sales predictions and real time project, pre predict like recommendations on websites or whatever. Like it, everyone's going to be getting into the data intensive game, um, which is really important. I also want to say too, especially with the tools like Kubernetes, CPU cycles are rarely the limiting factor for applications as they grow today. Um, like, cause if your, your application starts, you know, maxing out on CPU cycles, you just spin up a new, a new node or new cluster and you start scaling it up. Typically what happens with massively scalable applications um, that are using things like Kubernetes, it's data access and data flow. Um, it's either retrieving data quickly, saving data, updating data, whatever. Um, that tends to be the bottleneck for most applications. That, and um, it turns out the speed of light is also turning out to be a limiting factor for a lot of applications. Um, speed of light, we have not figured out how to break that law of nature Work, yet. Working but... on it, working on it. <laughs> yeah, I think Einstein had something to say about us not going faster than the speed of light, um, but Luckily for us, we can make databases and like our data retrieval faster too, which is really helpful. Um, so anyway, I want to talk just like, inter like introduce terms and concepts around data intensive applications. Um, and then maybe give some like tips and like guidelines for like how to get into the space and why maybe you should. And then we can end maybe with like making wild predictions about the future where Bart, you and I can watch this in like two years from now and see how wrong we were about like, we were, the predictions. We right. Yeah. We right. yeah, we were, you know, we were 20% right about our wild predictions. Idiotic predictions about the future, and actually, part I would be curious to hear your like thoughts on like where data is going to, um, and like how we're going to be accessing data. Because I know, I mean, you and I spend a lot of time in the space. This is, I I see. We, I really hear you on the. Um, I don't like using the term trickle down effect for anything, but the, yeah. <laughs> but what is it like? Let's say Fair. you know, big example companies, you know, Fangs, etc., doing this. But then, you know, other companies that were maybe dragging their feet a little bit in the same way that with, you know, migration to the cloud as with any, you know, technological uh, changes and paradigms as they shift, there are, you know, early adopters and then folks that join on later on. What, you know, when we're talking about storage, you know, always a silly example, right? You know, cat pictures, uh, your TikTok videos, mm -hmm. but, you know, but, but then when we start putting into you know, autonomous cars, things of that nature, the amount of data that's going to be, that's being, you know, that's going to be generated, that's going to have to be stored, that's going to have to be secure, that we're going to have to have backup, that we're going to have to have disaster recovery, and all these things are going to go along with it. And if we want, you know, the scalability, the retrieval, all those, th all those things so quickly, yeah. uh, I think it's, I think it's a very good point that that is going to continue to push in a very strong way, the, the the barriers maybe reaching the speed of light is mm -hmm. it's a healthy ambitious goal to have <laughs> um but i think that i think that it's i think it's very safe to say that and we see that as well too with you know the amount of funding that's going into the companies that are in the data space um yep. every week we're hearing about different companies in our ecosystem that are getting more money and a lot of that's because of the the promise of the technologies that they have with what mm -hmm. we assume they'll be delivering in the future yeah no, absolutely. Yeah, because I mean, everyone knows, like, I, I think even like my dentist is aware of how important data storage is and like that data demands are going to be going up. Um, 
I don't know. It, Bart, I don't know, but you, like I got, I come from the front endy JavaScript world, um, and like I kind of fell into the database world, um, and it's honestly been a happy accident too. Because I feel like there's not a lot of people here talking about it, which is shocking. Because I admit, like data is like not the coolest, funnest part about a lot of projects. It's not the showy part. But not the part you're bragging about to your friends. Um, but I think we can all acknowledge data is one of the most like critical parts of it. And if the data gets messed up or whatever, it's like, or it slows down, that's becomes like massively important. So like, it's something that's, that we can all acknowledge is important, but like, there's just not a lot of people talking about or making that like interesting out here. I think it's a good point. And that's precisely where your content comes into play because oh, yes. no, no, but no, but I really mean that is that, and most people agree is that yeah. because me as being an outsider first getting into this space, it's like, well, it does feel like this is rather traditional and conservative. There are reasons for that because of precisely what you said. Mm-hmm. Don't touch your data, leave it alone, you know, better safe than sorry. So when we get into these, uh, you know, when we get into this Kubernetes cloud native arena, there's still that sort of, you know, I don't want to be responsible for this if something goes wrong. If my data is here, I know exactly where it is. I can, you know, I can look at it, I can touch it, I can do whatever. If I move it to a new environment, can I guarantee that? And particularly mm-hmm. if you're a bank, if you're in the finance world, if you're handling medical records, things that are very sensitive, do you want to be responsible for that? It comes with a fair amount of responsibility. And that's yeah. exactly why we have this community so that practitioners can be more comfortable when they're making those decisions. And it's not so overwhelming or stressful at a personal or organizational level. Yeah, no, I totally agree. I, um, I, th- I want to just first define what a data intensive application is. Um, and I don't know if anyone has heard this book, but a lot of it comes from designing data intensive applications. Um, or I don't if you have you read this book before at all? No, no it's okay if you haven't. Um, I highly recommend it. I love it. It's a fairly great read. Um, it's a little more dense. I'd say like I, you'd have to have like a ba- an intermediate like a basic understanding of SQL and maybe just of databases it would really help and a little bit of like building out systems really helps. Um, but it is really helpful for this kind of thing too. Uh, yeah, Bart, I would super recommend it. It's wonderful. But um, he, Martin defines a data intensive application that is any application whose primary challenge is um, has to do with the quantity and complexity and speed of which you're accessing data as opposed to compute intensive applications where CPU cycles are the... Uh, the bottleneck for the application. Um, and he defines a data intensive application, one that's built out of these standard building blocks, he calls them. Um, and these are building blocks we use to save data, like a database, speed up our reads, which would be like a cache, um, search data, like indexes, and um, send messages through like streams and message queues and that sort of thing, and periodically crunch mass amounts of data, which is like analytics or batch processing maybe after hours or on a separate core or whatever. Um, but he talks about how all these pieces fitting together is like how, like where things get complicated uh, is when you start getting the weeds of kind of fitting these building blocks together in a data intensive application. Um, and he talks about like the big idea of his book is around three core pillars around um, maintaining data intensive applications around reliability, scalability and maintainability. Um, which I think is a really kind of a great intro to building them out um, and kind of, cause I think once you dig into each of these core tenants, you understand like why we have these systems and how they work as we kind of scale them out. Um, so yeah, it was like, I was thinking maybe we could just like talk about what those core look like and kind of dig in and give some oh, examples no, that together great. too. That sounds great. And cause like, you know, in terms of our audience and folks that are in our community, yeah. you know, touching on, SRE principles and also how that relates to the database world of, you know, yeah. DBRE, which is a growing, a growing area, but we, we do expect there to be more attention paid there. We've yeah. had a talk, we had a talk not that long ago, um, well, actually about a year ago in our first KubeCon about, you know, the road from DBA to SRE. So mm. we talk about these things of mm. scalability, reliability, perhaps these were things that, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, perhaps these were things that maybe some engineers didn't think were necessarily, you know, a part of their, you know, their toolkit uh, for, for what they were doing. But now is, you know, when you talk about these things of SLAs, SLAs, mm-hmm. SLIs, and having to, you know, frame this and, and a lot of what that comes down to as well is making sure your customers are happy based on the agreements that you have with them. Um, yes. And that's another funny thing too, for a lot of technical folks of remembering, you know, at the end of the day, you're, you're here to make sure that people are getting what they want. 
Yeah. And and so oh, absolutely. I, and so building that customer empathy element, I think is anyway, it's quite strong. So yeah, let's unpack this. Let's go for it. I, I just want to say that I think that's super important. I see a lot of engineers who are building and designing and architecting systems for other engineers. Um, and especially, I mean, depending on the product you're building, you need to make sure you're like not optimizing for your own internal experience at the expense of the customer's experience. So like we need to make sure they're having a flawless, smooth, fast, performant, easy to understand experience. Um, even if we have to work a little bit harder to make sure that that happens too. Which I think I, I've seen that more often than I care to share on like how uh, it just actually is fit. Also, I want to post this. Too. I'm going to post this in the YouTube live chat here. It's a, a blog post I just recently read called "We Don't Need Data Scientists. We Don't. We Need Data Engineers." Um, it's talking about the current data landscape of what's being hired, and this um, author is saying that he analyzed the Y Combinator startups and their hiring pool for this year, and he found there were seventy percent more data engineering roles than any other type of data, like more than machine learning more than data scientists, more than anything else. But the core thing he's saying there is we need to be teaching less data science and we need to be teaching more core engineering skills in this space um, because that's what's needed. And data engineering is about like cleaning up data and making them make sense, um, particularly for like machine learning models, other business units, whatever. Um, you're kind of like making sure that data is clean and pure, um, which I think is interesting. So I just, I, 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 I just wanted to like give some backup data to your claim that we should be teaching more engineering skills in this space. No, no. And can we take this a little bit further is that, yeah. And cause going back to what we were talking about, you know, when you come from the front end world and you're yeah. talking about, you know, CSS and JavaScript, like these things are they're very visual. They're very attractive. You can, you know, you can see them and, and there's a sort of innate creativity that goes along with it. Yeah. In this space, at least at face value, it doesn't necessarily seem to be the case. Although we can find lots of different examples that, you know, would, would prove that, to be wrong, but looking at the difference between data science and data engineering, what is it that you think needs, do you feel that, I'm just curious, do you feel that there's a difference in terms of how attractive they seem to people that are looking to get into the space? Oh so yeah. The perception yeah, yeah, yeah. of data science versus data engineering, how, how do you see that? Yeah, I, I totally agree. I've seen the same thing too. Like, I feel like, I mean, every boot camp has a data science thing. And I, I agree. I actually don't know a lot of data scientists are actually doing it, um, which is funny because I, I think a lot of boot camps are selling it. And I think they're selling those courses because it's it's very buzzy and hypey and like you hear a lot of people doing it, but like the data is showing that there's actually not a lot of, not a lot of jobs out there for those jobs, even though they're like really interesting too. It's So this article too, he talks about why data science isn't as big as what we thought it was going to be. Um, he says that it is because all these machine learning um, frameworks we're using, like TensorFlow, are becoming mm -hmm. so prevalent and so good um, that we are needing less people to kind of help build out the models. Uh, the, the limiting factor these days isn't the models and training them, it's getting clean data into the data sets. Um, and like that requires SQL skills, engineering skills to help clean up, modify, and kind of what is it, the ETL, the, the, or like the extract, transform, load, or whatever? Yep. Um, so doing a lot of that and like cleaning that data up as we load it into data sets that we can run models on. Um, but that's, but machines can't do that because if you don't have clean data to tell what it is, like it, you, a human being needs to get in there and do it. Um, so anyway, engineering skills are very important. And I agree, it's still, yeah, it's machine learning still cool and, and like um, everyone wants to do it and data science is cool. Um, but if you want to get like, you have a better chance of getting hired if you're doing, if you're focusing engineering skills. Agreed. Yeah. I don't know. I don't even want to get into like web three stuff either, but like, that's a whole other but thing. But you just did. Cause you said like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. let's, let's, mean, let's, tell me something this, controversial about web three. <laughs> I don't know. I actually, Bart, I'd love to hear yours. No, I, 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 have not, I have nothing to say. So. No, I, um, I've gone on a couple podcasts and said my opinions on Web3 and like, I just get silence. Um, but I'll, I'll, I will say my, uh, I will, I think Web3 is like not going anywhere. I think it's like, it's doing some really great things. I think it's awesome. Um, I think Web2 and Web3 are going to live together in peaceful harmony moving forward. And that's the way it is. I think that we are I feel like in tech, we get we go through these massive hype cycles every single time new tech drops. 
Um, the last example I can think of is microservices, where everyone went hard into microservices. And now we're coming, we're like realizing we went a little too hard and like realizing monoliths actually had some um, good ideas in there. And now we're seeing a, a better utilization of microservices, a more balanced use of it. Um, I think I, I see that with JavaScript frameworks all the time, the big hype, and then it kind of normalizes. And I think we're on the big hype cycle of Web3 tech right now, and I feel like it's going to normalize, and then we're going to find more appropriate uses for it. I don't think, and I it also just feel like it's pretty grifty right now still too, so just be careful out there, kids, if you're like going all in on it. Like, I think there's a career there for you, but just uh, be careful who you're listening to and how they're making money. <laughs> I think it's probably the important Yeah, thing. follow the paper trail, folks. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. If they're making money off of you or you're paying them lots of money, like it's probably not a great idea um it is tricky like web3 is tough because it's a the space you have it's different the standard is reversed because typically with we have a decentralized web standards and usually we make them and they're slowly adopted over decades web3 is a little bit different it takes a financial buy-in at the beginning in order to adopt the standard which really incentivizes um grifts um i think that'll get normalized and get kind of better maintained and regulated, but we'll see what happens. But it is funny too, because the web is based on a decentralized standard and we've seen it become centralized. And now we're seeing the same thing happen with Web3, the promise of decentralization and kind of what's happening there. I don't know. It's, um, I have a lot of thoughts on it. I think, but I think Web3 is great. I think there's some cool things about it. I just want everyone to be careful about the space. <laughs> yeah, as, as with anything, not, not if, very few things should be so important that there should be so much urgency that you have to dive right into it without asking questions. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that's just good life advice. Don't go into debt uh, for it, please. Don't, um, don't, yeah, it's not fun. Like it's really no. not fun. There's nothing cool about it. Like <laughs> no, like don't like invest money if you want, but don't invest money that you couldn't lose without your life falling apart. I will say that's uh, yeah, but otherwise, I, I know a lot of people are like making good money and like getting good followers. And I think a lot of newbies are getting to the space now and really attracted to Web three. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm, I'm I foresee a peaceful. It's it's like an SQL and no SQL. You know what I mean? Like there was that big us versus them, blah blah. blah like um, and then it, now we're kind of normalizing and we're seeing that both no SQL and SQL databases are kind of adopting the best parts of each other. And we're kind of meeting in the middle. Um, and I'm kind of seeing something similar probably going to happen with Web3 too. Let's take that a little bit further because, you know, something that comes up in our community because of how Kubernetes has been seen, historically speaking, yeah. L, it should only be for stateless workloads. We have, you know, lots of tweets from Kelsey Hightower coming out in the past. Mm -hmm. Until last year in June when he tweeted, you know, that we have now crossed the chasm that because of the L Caro operator being able to get, you know, Oracle databases, um, on Kubernetes due to some of the work that was done by Google and seeing that sort of shift because I go out there and I talk to a lot of people and times, sometimes when I say like, yeah, you know, you can run stateful workloads on Kubernetes and their response is, why would you do that? That's totally crazy. Mm. And I don't think the thing is, I think we're lucky enough to be in uh, what's still quite a niche space. So yeah. there isn't this like, you know, east side, west side, or, you know, like bad, bad blood sort of thing between one group and another. Yeah, I, you know, we're still in an innovative niche space. It's growing. Yeah, but I also think that people need to understand that we're not trying to say that this is the be all and end all of everything. And yeah. that there can be peaceful coexistence, and we can probably learn from each other. In yeah. terms of that Good stateful point. stateless debate, do you, would you want to comment on that at all? Yeah, that's a great actually. That's a great analogy. I um, and I get it. I feel like I. I mean, with anything, and I, it feels very human to be to be like. You make a thing and then people get all purist about it. And yeah, Kubernetes is to be stateful components and then you'd be run up and run down. And like, I feel like, again, that happened with microservices too. Microservices should be stateless components. And then the real world creeped in and everyone was like, oh, actually we need like a little bit of state for these. Mm -hmm. um, it's hard to maintain perfect functional stateless components that don't interact with anything else. It's very hard to do. Like I get it. Like theoretically it should be, but like then we get in the real world and that just that just isn't the way it goes. But same thing, I think the same thing with Kubernetes, right? Like Kubernetes are these great things with scaling up and scaling down nodes and servers and whatever too. But like 
the, the fact of the matter is we need we need to maintain state somehow. And it makes sense for us if we're maintaining our clusters in the cloud with Kubernetes that we're also auto-scaling our, our like, databases in the same like orchestration container, right? Like that doesn't feel weird to me. Um, it feels real to me. Uh, that feels like a real need. And it makes sense to do that with that tool. And we're seeing that it's possible. And actually, that probably is a good idea. Um, I'm also, I have a peek behind the scenes of a lot of databases of service companies. All of them are using Kubernetes behind the scenes to orchestrate your databases as a service in the cloud. And that's what's interesting as well, too, from the research report that we did, that a lot of org a lot more organizations than we expected yeah. are running state for workloads on Kubernetes. They're just not choosing to talk about it as much. And yeah. if we take that back to Web3, hype cycles, things of that nature, we wouldn't say that there's like a booming spike of seeing, you know, we, we do see more and more news about this. We do hear more and more end users, yeah. but it doesn't, it, like you said, it, it seems that it's something that, it seems that there's a debate about it because of, like I said, the, the Kelsey Hightower, and I'm not taking pot shots at Kelsey Hightower, I'm just saying like that train of thought of, of you know, things uh, of writing about this is how you do it. Yeah, um, and wanting to do things you know more easily and and save time and to say don't worry about that, but then like you said, you start peeking around to different you know database organizations and they're very much doing this. Perhaps mm -hmm. not commenting not on it directly with customers, feeling that it's on a need to know basis. I yeah. find it interesting, but it's something that mm -hmm. we've yet to really kind of pin down. Is that what do we need to do to make more folks talk about this openly? Yeah. Uh, how can we encourage those conversations? How can we, and, you know, as a community of practice to show the value that practitioners gain by, you know, pushing for these uh, new approaches in their organizations? Yeah, that makes so much sense to me. I've actually never thought about that before, but you're totally right. Like, yeah, tech is very hype driven uh, and data and Kubernetes is not like, it's not as hype, hyped as uh, Web3 distributed yeah. database or something like that. Like that, those are the things you're right. Those are the things getting the technical talks. Um, and I think people are talking about it. Like, I mean, you guys, you and I went to KubeCon. I said, I went to every database on Kubernetes talk that they had, um, but you're right. It's not, those weren't, those weren't like the sellout crowds, uh, which is like too bad. I mean, maybe just, does it just go back to just data is just not the, the, the part that people are like excited to talk about, even though it's so important. I don't know. Maybe, yeah, what um, I often say is that like data, uh, data's neck beard has a neck beard. You know, like in in that. So if we want to, use, and I'm and I'm not judging anybody. If you've got a neck beard or two, that's yeah, great. Yeah, yeah. I, know it's, I love you just as much as I love metaphorical you. metaphorical neck beard. But yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so because of that, is how can we make this a you know a warmer you know a celebratory kind of space? And we are doing that in our community, and you're yeah. doing that with your content. The problem is that it's me and you. Like we need to get other, and there are other folks out there. I'm not, I, 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 could, I could definitely mention sure. other names. <laughs> Metaphorically, you and I. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we are the, we are the beard. Yeah, um, yeah. But, uh, but yeah, I think that, I think that that's uh, something that we're we're going to continue to do. People will see that in our next KubeCon. We're going to have our KubeCon promo coming out, and we always you know do things differently. Mm. But I think that that's kind of the the emphasis that needs to go into there to make it so people get excited about talking about this. Yeah, and I love that. Actually, I love to brainstorm that because I, I mean, I, 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 I haven't thought about this. This isn't like a, a thought out thought here, but I feel like um, yeah, getting people excited about it is like interesting too, or like getting people talking about it. And I love that you're doing that conference to get, like get people to share what they're doing too. But I, I mean, like I feel like building a community to because I'm looking at like the most successful frameworks, tools, and libraries, and languages out there, and they tend to be ones with, like, amazing beginner support. Um, the Pythons, Jupiters, the Reacts, the Views, I think Svelte is having a, a moment right now at that. Um, um, but those communities all have, like, this amazing supportive community that just, like, welcomes newbies in there, too. And data doesn't feel like, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking a lot here of, like, why no one goes to data first? Why do people go to JavaScript first um, or Node? And they, they should. I did too. Um, but can, is it possible to be a space where like people are excited about learning about how, how data works? Um, I think a lot of that comes down to, or at least in, in my experiences, 
how can we relate this to everyday things where people yeah. are okay like now i can do it like we had a wonderful speaker shout out to way goo mm-hmm. in his presentation was talking about graph databases but then was showing us how this related to basketball statistics mm-hmm. and you can like basketball or not but mm-hmm. like it, it makes it so much easier when you have an example in front of you like okay like we're talking about shots taken versus yeah. you know points scored three pointers etc 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 and i think the in my opinion, and once again, as an outsider, I feel like the more that we can get these examples inside, the more people see the relevance, the easier it is to, to connect to, and the less it's just like, a, you know, technical content in a technical desert. Yeah. Um, I think that, and, and you know, there's, and you need different kinds of content for people at different levels, but in order to generate more mass appeal and this kind of interest, I really encourage people as much as possible to try to link these things together. Yeah. I love that. No, I totally agree. I, I talk about that a lot too. Actually, that's like my, um, I'm going to break here, but my TED talk is about too. It's like finding your joy in programming. Um, and it doesn't matter. It doesn't have to be what I like. Like, for example, the thing I, that I do a lot of is this whole field called the digital humanities, um, which is about like mixing like philosophy, art, media with tech. Um, so I, 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 some, a, a project I'm really proud of and I love is a, a website I call Bechtel.io. It's a project I work with my sister, but um, if you're not familiar with the Bechtel test, um, actually, so it take, analyzes movie, movie scripts to let you know if it passed the Bechtel test and it gives you a bunch of gender-based analytics on those films. But um, the Bechtel test is a film test of three rules. One, it's in film with, with two or more named female characters that two have a conversation with each other about three, something that is not a man or men. Um, so just kind of doing that. But that was fun. Like doing that was fun, like analyzing all these massive movie scripts and like running all these gender analytics and writing like a research paper on them. Um, that was cool. And that clicked with me. I don't know. Movies is something I love. But yeah, it doesn't side, matter. Side, what... side note, I'm derailing our, we're like derailing the derailed <laughs> conversation. That's good. Could you, could you like, could you find a way to incorporate that into your KubeCon CFP? Because that would be dope. Actually, that would be, that would be amazing. I totally could. Actually, that'd be amazing. Yeah. yeah I, um... Or like, let's reserve another date for that just to specifically focus on it. Because <laughs> I find that e- extremely awesome. And, and, and once again, like it's, uh, I think that's kind of, I think where you nail it. Like I said, it's not that it has to be basketball or that has to be this or that. Yeah. When things are, when things are done with passion, um, yeah. the ripple effect is so much stronger. And so just yeah. like, no, no, find a way to mix this with something that you enjoy in your free time. Yeah. And then you're going to be more excited about it. And then, you know, that has a, a, a sort of, like I said, a ripple effect on the audience. Yeah, no, I totally agree. Yeah. I, um, I don't know. I, I, I just want to like help other people find that and like see what's cool about that. Cause yeah. data is cool. You can do some innovative stuff on there. Um, I, I'm going to give one more example of something I did too that I'm pretty proud of. I, I made a project called punk, which is P U N C like it's short for punctuation, but it analyzes punctuation of eBooks. Um, but we get to invent a new way of analyzing Shakespeare, which is one of the most like researched, you know, uh writers of all time but like discovering a new way to analyze his work and the reason is is like i think the people like are you and i and the people watching this i think we're uniquely positioned as engineers to explore these spaces that not a lot of people feel comfortable with um and like i think we could find and do cool new things with that that no one's ever really thought of before um i don't know i just think i think there's a lot of power in that that's inspiring for me I think that's really cool and i want other people to get excited about that too um yeah i'm not a basketball guy Cool. No, like that's fine. Says, and, I, go and, I don't wa- and I don't watch basketball religiously either. Yeah. Like yeah. I, I played as a kid, but like, and yeah. I like watching basketball more than some other sports. Yeah. Um, but I think but that's the point. It's that's like, it. yeah, yeah. It's building what you want to build. Yeah. I think the other part too, and I, I was actually going to talk about this a little bit today too, but like getting into data and like, and like giving some helpful tips. So if you're, you're somebody who's like, maybe you're an engineer, maybe you're a brand new programmer and like, you want to get more into data, the data space, data engineering, like, how would you go about doing that? Um, and let's see, maybe I'll give some tips and then Bart, I'd actually love to hear your journey there. Cause I feel like, I mean, you and I think we're both feel like we're a little bit like outside. I, maybe everyone feels that way in data. We're like not natively data people. And we like came oh, into the space. Yeah. I, I can definitely talk about that, but no, you go first. Okay. Yeah. 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 I would love to hear about that. I, um, so, um, Let's see. I wrote some down here. Where are these? Um, yes. The first thing I think that is really helpful is um, uh, building portfolio projects. Um, 
I don't think that's anything too innovative there, but like, no, just like, no, no, but it is because it, you, if you haven't met Dewan Ahmed yet, who used to work at Red Hat now is at Avon, he had a great post on LinkedIn where he did very succinct saying, your resume will disappear and what will yeah. be important is your portfolio yeah. and your content. Um, focus on that. I, I I totally agree. The work you do for a company, you cannot take with you. You can take your followers, your posts, your videos with you everywhere you go. Um, I would encourage you to do that too. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree. Um, let's see here. Uh, yeah, building portfolio projects, I think is cool. I think, and like the more you can do that, and I think that is the port too, where like you kind of have to explore the spaces and you might not know at the beginning what you care about. Um, I think that even before you get there then, it's like try to like get involved with the community. I think places like the Data and Kubernetes conference, these live streams, Twitter is a great place to start. Start following people in the like the data space you think are doing interesting things. I follow a lot of like people who are doing like cool art projects or data science projects or doing data visualizations at like the New York Times. I think that's really cool. Um, but those are really inspiring for me to like help come up with cool projects to work on. Um, I think if, especially I would encourage you to be working on your core engineering skills, particularly around data engineering. Um, so if you're like interested in learning languages, make sure you're learning like SQL, um, no SQL, Python is really good in the data space, um, Java, um, you can even do Node, it's less, not, it's a single threaded, so it's not as good, but what, do whatever you want, but those are good ones to start with. Um, yeah, machine learning, get, like maybe a little bit of that, to be honest, I'm not an expert in that space, I just use like other people's tools, yeah. um, and cloud computing and things like Kubernetes, I think are really helpful too. Um, but yeah, I think just learning how to program is probably the best thing you could probably do and just building out cool data science projects or data projects would be amazing. I, or I opening think them right. up. I if you can make right. a data set, open that up for people, like that's rad. That's cool. That, that's, and also I think these are, these are interesting things because it combines both the technical aspect as well as the non-technical aspect. Non-technical aspect of understanding content sharing means by default not everybody is going to like your content as much as you yeah. and you may get negative comments you probably will get negative comments don't take them seriously mm -hmm. if you can extract anything about them that will actually help you improve i'm someone who's super sensitive when i started mm -hmm. a youtube channel uh, about five or six years ago and i got negative comments and bad views or like you know very limited views and things like that yeah. it was crushing and i had to yeah. learn and I, I, I would say I still got some work to do on that area, but oh, same. Yeah. Um, but like, I just want to tell folks, you know, whether it's your GitHub repo, if you're, you know, trying to uh, submitting a pull request and you get rejected or things like that, yeah. enjoy the process. Don't think of this as a be all and end all moment that's just, you know, destroying you. But I think it's interesting that while working on technical skills, you also have to be thinking about where's my self-esteem? What, yeah. what are the things that make me happy? What are the mm -hmm. things that are making me driven? Don't expect to get everything right. Uh, be patient regarding the programming languages. Start with one until you get comfortable with it. Then you can start adding more, but don't feel like you have to learn everything all at once. Yeah. Um, anyway, I think there's there's some really good stuff. And obviously in your case, mm -hmm. having switched over, mm -hmm. yes, we do see you know the rise of the full stack developer. You know, that's been more and more common in mm -hmm. the last in the last 10 or so years, but it's still it's still challenging to go from one space to another. And as someone mm -hmm. who's completely not technical going into a very technical space yeah. crushed by imposter syndrome and all that kind of stuff. Like I've, mm -hmm. I've dealt with that, but like, but at the same time, I would say that I built that up much more than others have built it up for me. Once you're transparent with people and you explain like where you're at, it's generally pretty difficult to start criticizing somebody if they've been very open and honest about what they don't know. Yeah. Um, so I would, I would recommend, I think, and I feel like this is more in the U S perhaps than other places, but the pressure to always have to say that like, even if you don't know something that you do know it, but oh, yeah, then you're like crossing your fingers that well, yeah. I hope they don't start asking more questions because I'm going to mm. um, I, I don't want to see people falling into that trap because it's, it's, it's just not comfortable. No, I agree. Yeah. And it's like, you, you feel like a phony. Yeah. And saying, I don't know is always okay. And even at work, I, something I say a lot is I don't know, but let me find out for you. Like, I'll figure it out. Give me till tomorrow or whatever. That's you it. know what I mean? That's it. That's it. Yeah. He's like, you know what? Actually, I haven't heard that person's name or I didn't read that book or I mm. didn't read that blog. Um, um, I just want to touch on, we got a comment really quickly. Yeah, um, yeah. So a view from a grumpy legacy DBA. I see even more silos uh, than before. I have seen operational and analytical data totally separated in organizations. 
Also, cloud and Kubernetes separates traditional databases and their DBAs from cloud databases. Most cloud databases are self-admin by with their dev teams. That's a really interesting observation. First of all, thank you very much for sharing it. Joe, what do you think about that? Yeah, that is that is so true. Let's see here. Um, so the whole thing is about like separating out things or separating out data from the rest of the company. I've worked in companies. I've seen this firsthand. I would say it is true. I feel like that is very corporate uh, America, depending on the type of company we're for to, like if there's an issue, we'll just hire someone to fix that problem. Um, you're not systemically addressing the issue as an organization. Um, for example, I worked in a large co company um, in the US that, um, like for example, we were having site performance issues where the site was slowing down. So they hired a site reliability expert, a site performance to speed it up. And the thing is, it's like, they're expecting a magic bullet. I'll hire this person, they'll speed up my website. But the problem is that it is like a death by a thousand paper cuts. Like every team is just not taking like performance as a, something that's important and should be cared about and like part of the culture to fix that systemically. So then they, they just hire someone, they throw it over the fence, they expect this person to kind of fix all these little tiny little things. Um, but the same thing happens, I think with data, right? We're like hiring these data engineers we're expecting them to just kind of like make it work and they're not really part of it. Like for, I think data doesn't get addressed with DevOps culture. We're not really addressing that with how we're maintaining those clusters. Like, right. That's like, it's just, it's always an afterthought. It feels like the separate thing that we know is important, but it isn't really considered. Or if it is, it's the last thing to be considered, which is kind of, yeah, it sucks. I, um, I don't know. I, to me, this feels like, is this like an engineering leadership issue of not taking data as seriously as it probably should be? Um, and I think it needs to be addressed from like a leadership systemic issue and making sure that those are like incorporated and like given the same level of care and thought like application developers are giving um, in their thoughts too. I don't know. And like, there, I do have the mixed feelings too. I, it depends on the org and it doesn't like... Like a full stack developer, I, I've seen those work too, where like a team owns their microservices and you own everything on that. You own the data and the caching and the servers and the services and APIs, you own everything. But like um, that can lead to issues too of people like not understanding what they're doing too. I don't know. I, I feel like it boils down to like leadership and education. Um, I don't think no, there's I, an easy I, answer I, for no, it. I think, oh, I think, no, and, and there doesn't have to be, you know, a yeah. answer for it. Leadership and education. I think I think those both those encompass um, a lot of the factors that would go into that. Yeah. And also, particularly in your case, you know, like being the dev rel, dev advocacy side, when explaining, you know, who am I, you know, focusing on? Like, like you said, that there might be a tendency to be like, oh, this is for DBAs, this is for people in these areas. Yeah. When, like, as you rightfully said, well, why isn't the VP of engineering and also the DevOps folks? Why aren't they being involved as well too? And so, kind of mapping out who those stakeholders are, you know, who who needs to be involved in this from a decision-making perspective? I think those are very good questions, but I really yeah. like the comment from, from someone that, that left us on Slack about how while trying to remove silos, only creating more, and the, the threat that that poses towards, mm -hmm. um, we can say organizational health, um, culture, people being willing to collaborate with each other and seeing each other as friends rather than, oh, enemies or competing for budgets or things of that nature. Yeah. Um, those, are, those are important things for people to have on the table when they're making these decisions. As much as we're talking about technology, at the end of the day, we're talking about people and we've got to be taking that seriously. It yeah. can often seem that, oh, this is just, you know, it's only rational. We're only, we're only, we're always being emotional. And mm -hmm. so I feel like the more that we try to say that we're irrational, we're only hiding the fact that there, there's these very, very human elements involved there. Oh, um, I totally agree. I love that. No, you're totally right. Yeah, I totally agree. I feel like that's the Web3 space is trying to solve that with like the smart contracts. But I, in my personal humble opinion, um, like uh, it's not addressing a lot of like real world human needs. And you're right, a lot of it just needs to be a conversation. It needs to be encouraging collaboration and not competitiveness or like antagonism between different teams or whatever. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's it, it's so tricky though. I. I, I, I'm trying to think of like practical things to do to, to get those working. I don't know. Like, honestly, like I've done like internal hackathons. Those tend to be the place I get to know people from other teams the best. And those typically have long running, like I work with them great till, you know, 
as long as we're working there. I don't know. Those, those have worked really well for me in the past. Because I think that offers the fundamental supposition that everybody has something to offer and everybody can learn from each other and everybody yeah. has complementary skill sets. And that gives you the opportunity to explore that by working with folks from, from other areas that you perhaps don't have that much contact with yeah. and just having a basic, you know, human empathy and appreciation for what they're doing. And that they're not waking up every day thinking, Oh, how can I ruin Joe's day? Or how can I ruin Bart's day? Like mm-hmm. hopefully, hopefully not. You know, I don't think most people, I don't think there are many people that do, that do think that. Yeah. Um, and yeah. if, if there are, they should be detected quite quickly and dealt with accordingly. Yeah. <laughs> but, <laughs> Um, but I do think it's still, like I said, I really like this part about, um, our community because while we have deep dives on, you know, networking and storage and database that we can also have these, these conversations about, well, okay, one thing is the technical aspect, but if we're going to be building an operator, you know, what's the human involvement there? Um, how are we going to avoid, avoid burnout? Who needs to be involved here? How soon do we communicate this in what fashion? Who's going to be adopting this? All these are, are difficult questions that, I'm not yeah. terribly jealous of the people who have to make those decisions. I'll put it that way. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't think there's easy answers for me either. Yeah. It is real though. I want to validate those feelings on it though, too. I see a lot. I think QAs get that a lot or quality assurance or testers get that a lot too. They feel like their stuff is just kind of thrown over a wall at them. Um, DevOps people probably feel that way. Data people feel like maybe everyone just feels that way. Now that I'm saying this, maybe everyone just feels like they're uh, <laughs> getting stuff thrown over the wall. But I think, but I think if that's the case, I think if that's the case, then yeah. I think that 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 kind of forces the question of how can we get more empathy in our organizations in order to remove that sort of natural hostility and tension between departments. Mm-hmm. And that's and that's not unique to tech. I mean, no, I, I worked no. in public education. Like you have the same same battles there. Yeah. Um, I think we all just have to be constantly asking ourselves what we can do to become better people and to to really appreciate each other more and to offer genuine support. Mm-hmm. The pandemic should be helping us with that. Um, unfortunately, I don't, I'm sure it has helped in some areas and I've yeah. also seen extreme selfishness rather than yeah. selflessness. So, um, I think just first of all, as individuals, what can I do to be more empathetic? What small yeah. actions can I take to be a better listener and not just listening with your ears? Um, but mm-hmm. I, and then from there, how can I encourage, you know, best practices amongst my coworkers and then, and then at an organizational level with that in I mind, that. with that in mind, in your work, Right, at single store, you're out there talking to a lot of people, you know, you're very much in touch with the um, apprehension, doubts, reluctance, etc. When it comes to running data on Kubernetes, what do you think is the biggest hurdle? Like, is it, we, we talk about this in, in, is it a technological challenge? Mm-hmm. Is it a, is it a financial challenge? It's, we don't have enough people for these roles. What do you mm-hmm. think, what's your gut, you know, feeling that tells you that, what, what does it tell you about the, the real challenge is right here. And so in order to make that better, I would recommend. Yeah. Is- First, my gut is it's like, a, uh, like a, it's a PR problem. Like people just don't like feel good about it. It's like mature. People are doing massively scalable things on Kubernetes. Um, there's a lot of info about it, but people, I think, I think my gut is, it's just people are like, <gasps> just like, they just are like scared of it. Um or maybe just don't understand it. Yeah, I, I, um, I feel like the cure for that is just like hearing people talk about it more though. Um, like making it, like showing success stories um, and people talking about it. I don't know. Yeah, what do you think? I'm... No, I would, I would tend to agree. I, it's just like with anything else. An example that we've mentioned more than once is that our content, um, head of content, Silvan mentioned a while back, yeah. Is, you know, when people started first started using cars, uh, apparently I'm not even sure if this is true, but maybe it is. Uh, you heard <laughs> Metaphorically. Uh, exactly. The metaphorical neck beard and now the metaphorical yeah. metaphor. Yeah. So uh, when people started using cars, in order not to freak people out, they would put like a fake horse's head on the front. So people were like, <laughs> okay, like it's, it's still relatively similar. When yeah. we're going through those transitional phases, yeah. we, like there is the top down factor. Like you said, we want to see you know, the fang companies, once they're mm-hmm. doing it, like, okay, well, now we can start to test the waters. Then we also have, you know, if, if engineers, if data engineers and, you know, DBAs and, and folks at, at that level are realizing this is going to make my life easier. So I'm going to propose this internally in my organization and see what kind of traction I can get. Yeah. You know, I think, but like you said, having the visibility of those success stories, which is once again, why this community exists is that if you say, well, look, 
we've had 120 different people come on here for webinars, mm -hmm. ranging from someone who came from a, a front end background to someone who's basically lived inside of a database for the last you know uh, quarter of a century. Mm -hmm. um, with all those different perspectives and from different parts of the world, it seems that we have one thing in common and that yes, this is possible. And that additionally, there are benefits. Yeah. So I think once again, community of practice comes down to that. Yeah. I, I also think, like you said, is that, and whether it's for data on Kubernetes or for anything, if you say, this is a great idea without having examples, well, your argument's probably only going to get so far. Yeah. Um, so do your homework. You know, that's mm -hmm. why we have a research report. That's why we have all the content that we have. Yeah. Um, those things do, I think, do make a difference. I want to take it one step further once again, because you're in DevRel, mm -hmm. which is, you know what, that's a growing space too. Um, yeah. That's constantly evolving. Five years ago, did were you talking about DevRel or when did that sort of you know, come into No, I mean, yeah. came a developer advocate in like 2018, um, 2019. Um, maybe it's 2018. Yeah, it's it, it's still new. I think it's like Apple and Twilio have been doing it for a while. Um, but yeah, I think the space is getting out. I will say like COVID has made more companies realize how important DevRel and community managers are. Um, Especially when everything went online, it's online like in-person events kind of just shut down. Everyone's like, "Oh crap!" We like this is really like this is the only place where like people are we're going to be reaching people. Um, yeah, yeah, it's changed a lot. But like, the whole thing with DevRel is like helping change perception around some piece of tech. The problem rarely is technological. Uh, the problem usually has to do with human beings. It tis our nature. Uh, we're uh, emotional creatures with uh, uh, strong opinions and their uh, limited time and slow brains. Um, <laughs> I'll just speak for myself anyways. No, no, um, no, but I, th I think, I think <laughs> I mean, the, the brain comment, that can be debated, but, no, but I think the rest of it, I think the rest of it, like you said, um, we are as emotional as we are, you know, rational or whatever. One yeah. Want. yeah. And, and sometimes more than, than one or the other. Yeah. So keeping all those things in mind, I think, and like you said, I think the pandemic accelerated that even more because of not being able to be face to face. Mm. All those different, you know, in the past of having, you know, workshops where you could have a hundred people together and stuff like that, yeah. and now and now that shifted. So how do we get that human empathy, those yeah. emotions, into these digital spaces? There's not one easy answer for that. There's not. No. You know, there's no silver bullet. It's trial and error. Yeah, and probably a lot more error than trial. <laughs> Um, you know, and, I didn't think about this too with like yeah. the data space and Kubernetes and data is like a, a two layers of abstracted, complicated tools. Like for the problem with databases and getting people to try them, like like getting people to try a new JavaScript framework makes sense. You just spin up a little hello world, but like data is hard. Like we can spin up a managed service cluster of databases really easy for you, um, you know, online. But then you're like, okay, you have an empty database. Now what? You know what I mean? Like you can put data in it. Who cares? You can put data in anything. Like it's it, get that that hurdle is hard for like helping like walk people through why it's cool. And then two, like and then you have data on Kubernetes, and it's like okay, so now you have a database. I don't know what to even do with it. And then we're putting a database on Kubernetes. It's it just like it's like so hard to like both those pieces are complicated pieces. It's like many hurdles to get people to like understand it too. I don't know. I don't blame people for like being intimidated by the space. It is intimidating. I do think that the winners of the data wars are the ones that are going to be the easiest to use than anybody else. If someone can figure out how to like, and I, that's actually, this may be a good time to talk about like the future of data here too. Cause I, I think we're going to see this stuff get abstracted away. Oh, like a lot. Um, I think there'll be some people managing this stuff, but I foresee a future where like AI is, managing our indexes and spinning up clusters like as we run out of space and kind of doing this for us automatically i think kubernetes is moving us in that direction i'm foreseeing like i want like a jarvis from iron man running my kubernetes clusters with databases you know what i mean i want it making recommendations and implementing it i want it normalizing and denormalizing it based on my usage patterns i want it to spin up indexes based on queries that are running a lot in the wild um I want all of that. And I, I think the company or tool or whatever that figures that out is the one that people are going to start flocking to. Um, because at the end of the day, like, I feel like, I'm, especially I'm speaking as a person who comes from the application developer world, I don't really care about 
all the nitty gritty of like what's going on in the databases. I want my, I want to save my data. I want it to be there when I come back later on and I don't want it to be corrupted and I want it to be fast. I just want to put it there and I want to get back quickly. Um, and like, I feel like, if, and Kubernetes, I think is still like in this early days of trying to figure out how to do this. Data on Kubernetes is still in the early days of trying to figure out how to do this. I think it's a solved problem. I think right now it's about making that as easy and as seamless as possible for everybody. I don't know. We'll see what happens with it, but oh, I'm. No, that's good. That's nice. And I think, yeah. and I think like you said, is that, and cause I see this as well too, cause I have friends that are, have been big data engineers for the last 10 years. Yeah. And when I start to tell them about like, oh, like come check out some of our webinars. They're like, are you crazy? Like this is totally over my head. But you know, 10 years ago when people were making the transition to Spark, Hadoop, Storm, Elastic, all these, you know, this big data stack that yeah. seemed, you know, for some organizations to be insurmountable. But it was when, you know, the industry starts pushing you in that direction, eventually, you know, sink or swim and you just start learning these things. Yeah. So I think that, like you said, it's on us to make this a more welcoming and inviting space, mm -hmm. like a space where it's easy for, like you said, is it a coincidence that all these battle tested, you know, wonderful programming languages have great documentation and make it easier for beginners <laughs> to get started? Well, yeah. no need to reinvent the wheel. If it worked there, it'll work elsewhere. Well, and and yeah. we do have a lot of young people and, and people that are directly using data on Kubernetes technologies inside our community. So it's nice to see that. Um, we're just about out of time. And I told you before we started that I do have to ask you the magic question, which we've kind of probably touched on already in different ways. One thing is what is running data on Kubernetes? Another thing is how to do it. But if Joe Carlson has to give one reason as to why, all right, for you, what is the key benefit of doing this? Why should organizations care about it? Why is it important? I don't think of a single word. Why should companies run data on Kubernetes? Simplicity. I think like maintaining, like it makes sense if you're orchestrating containers on Kubernetes, it makes sense to do that. I think a commonly under considered thought around picking tools, uh, and I know I said the opposite earlier, but is like, what is your culture internally? And if you have like a, you know, like a, if your your team knows Kubernetes, it's you're gonna have an easier time adopting Kubernetes for stateful management. Um, if you're already you have a team trained up around how to use it, um, unlike what I said earlier, where you don't pick tools just for your dev team, um, I think that this one this has a this has a pros for the users and for your your team. Um, so yeah, simplicity. Good, nice answer. Nice answer. Once again. No perfect answer to this. <laughs> so, no, no, no. I mean, we, this is why we ask everybody. No, this yeah. is why we ask everybody. But I, I certainly like that one. And I like that you synthesize it into one word, um, simplicity. So that's good. In a world that seems increasingly complex, a little bit of simplicity goes a long way. You know, in uh, tech pros, we love to make things more complicated than they should be. It sounds smart. We love that. <laughs> <laughs> that's our favorite. <laughs> okay. Um, folks that... For whatever reason, and it, it better be a good one, don't know if you already or aren't following you already on, on social, the best place to find you is, or best places, oh. put them here in the Zoom chat because they won't go in on YouTube since you're not an admin. Oh, okay, gotcha, cool. Um, let's see, can I do, I have a one of those like fancy link things. Let's see here. Oh, you got a link tree. I got a link tree. Yeah, yeah, but Man, always hit me up on, um, I'm going to post it in our Zoom chat. Oops. Yeah, uh, let's drop that in here. Uh, but the best place is uh, joecarlson.dev slash links. Otherwise, best place to follow me is on Twitter at Joe Carlson and the number one or on TikTok. If that's your thing. If it's not, that's cool too. Um, and then I'd also love to connect with anyone on LinkedIn too. I do a lot of shit posting over there too. So if you uh, have a stomach for that, then go check that out. Yeah, no, I love your uh, too long did not read, didn't read stuff. Um, Thank you. <laughs> no, no, seriously, like for me, it's a joy because there's a lot of bad content on both LinkedIn and Twitter. And yeah. when I see your stuff, I know it's like, if for me, it's like a breath of fresh air. Um, and yeah, I try not to post the boring LinkedIn stuff. Yeah, no, 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 you do it. You do a good job. And you make <laughs> and you make me feel that a lot of my LinkedIn stuff is boring. <laughs> no, 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 no. I know, but I want to know, I want to know, when did you start referring to yourself as a cringe coder? Uh, you know, I, I can't remember what I had before that. It was, uh, I think it was after, okay, so this is the other most embarrassing thing too, is like this past year of like, developed a small following on LinkedIn and like it, uh, that became one of the most embarrassing facts about me was that I, <laughs> I don't I have a link, I'm an LinkedIn influencer. That just feels really cringy to me. Uh, so anyway, I just, uh, I, whatever. And I feel, I feel like 
You know, I am cringe, but I am free. You know, I am, I'm going to post, I feel like my content is very earnest, um, which in a post irony world, I'm like, I am just, I'm, I'm over it. I just want to be as real as possible people. So, which I feel like some people might think that's cringe. I don't think I've ever actually been called that to my face, but uh well, by, calling, by, by calling yourself that, you remove the right. <laughs> Pre-empting it. Like, that's good. It's, it's very smart. That's right. Very smart. No, it's cool. <laughs> no, but I, I really respect it. And I really appreciate your honesty, uh, both in this conversation, as well as all the stuff that you're putting out there. Yeah. Very, and, and very serious and, and genuine about helping people. And I think that's what this is all about. Yeah. Um, when we're talking about DevRel, Dev Advocacy, community building, et cetera, you've really, really, really got to be thinking about, you know, paying it forward. What can yeah. we be doing to get um, folks in, in a better position than they are right now? Uh, yeah. So I, I, I do admire that. One thing really quickly before we wrap up is that we have a tradition, you know, while we're talking, we have our amazing one of a kind artist, Angel, who's creating artistic depictions <gasps> of the stuff that's being talked about. So this <sighs> is difficult to synthesize the very tangent ridden conversation that we've just had. Um, and so all apologies to our audience as well for sticking it through. But this is what Angel put together in terms of some of the different things that we touched on. As usual, he did an amazing job. Um, wow, but, uh, I love this. And we love you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The first, uh, he did not put a towel in the background. I guess I should have told him that, but that's, that's okay. Uh, making data on Kubernetes history here. Um, I dropped all your links in the YouTube chat. Uh, we'll, we'll put that as well, well in, in Slack when we share, when we share the links. Um, Joe, it was a pleasure to have you here with us today. I very much hope we can get you in KubeCon. I very much would love to take a look at the uh, database related to um, questions about female representation. I think that's fantastic. I would definitely like to take that further in another conversation. Um, so please don't be a stranger and we will very much be in touch. All right. I love it. This has been such a pleasure. Your community is amazing. I'm so like, just... I'm just, uh, I'm just loving a part of it. It's so fun. Yeah, we're right. The thing is, hanging out with people like you is, is why we do the things that we do. And uh, like I said, looking forward to the next steps. All right. All right, man. Take it easy. Have a good one.